Well, good afternoon. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Voices of Freedom Project in the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today is uh, 10 April 2021. We're out in Edinburgh, uh, Virginia, and I'm with Pierre Jutra. Uh, sir, good, good afternoon. If you would just uh, tell us again your full name and where you grew up. Um, name is Pierre David Jutra. Um, French name, but I was Canadian. Um, I grew up actually, and I was born in Massachusetts, but grew up in South Carolina where my dad got a job okay. at uh, Clemson University. Okay, excellent, excellent. And um, what what conflicts did you participate in? Um, Operation Iraqi Freedom was a, a conflict that I participated in. And and what branch of service were you? Uh, U.S. Army. U.S. Army. Okay, excellent. Uh, as was I, the the great the great army. Uh, if you would, just think about like uh, uh, your family members. Did you have any relatives before you that had served in the, in the military? Um, my dad did not uh, as a Canadian citizen for most of his life, and then you know he did transition, but uh, he wasn't didn't have the opportunity. Um, I did have some uncles and grandfathers that did serve um, in the past, but uh, just a, just sporadic, more on my mother's side than on my dad's side. In the in the U.S. or in the, in the in U.S. The, yes. Any any relatives in the Canadian military? Not that I know of. That we've know. had a hard time tracking back yeah, on that yeah. side of the family. But so, but so a little bit on your dad's side, and you said your mom's side too. On your mom's my side. My mom's side. Yeah. yeah excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, um, just thinking about uh, in general, kind of as a lead up initial question. Think back to September 11th, 2001. Uh, you know, the attack on America. Where where were you that day? What were you doing? Just kind of talk us through what happened. For, what was your ex experience that day? Um, we lived in Alexandria at the time. I was actually uh, in a special ops assignment up in this area. And um, our house, which is located in Franconia, right in Alexandria, that, that area, um, you know, we, one of the planes actually flew over. You know, we wondered, you know, you could hear it. And it's not unusual to have plane activity, but um, we started hearing the news and all that and what was going on at that point in time. So it was pretty uh, pretty interesting. So you, did you actually see one of the planes? You saw the plane fly by? Well, yeah, it was pretty low and kind of loud. So yes, we you know we uh, we were at the house here and we just looked out the windows and just noticed and saying what you know what's it doing? Yeah. But uh, we we soon found out. Did you hear an impact or no? Or, no, I didn't hear any impact. Yeah, and and obviously. Um, not to get into anything classified or, or anything like that, but um, what happened in the hours after that, as far as like your unit, did you get any special status or anything else happened for you? Um, I was in a, I was, we were conducting um, training at that time. So um, I didn't get any special status. They did inform us, you know, what was going on, but um, we got, we had to continue what we were doing. Um, that was, uh, at that that day, um, I don't remember the actual day it was, but um, we, uh, you know, I did have to go back in the next day and all that and go and work and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, and being a military professional, what kind of went through your mind when when I think Americans kind of went through the process, like the 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 attack in New York? Hey, was this an when it went from an accident perhaps to a terrorist attack? What were your thoughts on that? Well. Um, Kind of expected, you know, that uh, things would get ramped up pretty quickly, and they'd, you know, have to figure out where it came from. And then I, I, we kind of expected the, there'd be retaliation or, or you know, a, a response from the U.S. right away. But um, I guess it took a while for us to figure out, you know, why it happened and where it came from, that sort of thing. Well, then, um, so going back to to you personally, you had a few relatives in the in the military before you, but. Why, why did you join the military in general and then the Army specifically? What was your path? Hmm. Okay, well, growing up in South Carolina, um, the area uh, was, there wasn't a lot of opportunity, I guess, it depends. Um, of course, I, I went through high school, and in high school, I was a little bit of a, um, less of a conscientious high schooler than I was, you know, just having a good time and working and that sort of thing. But uh, came to a period of time that I wanted to do something different. I was looking for some type of thrill or experience and that sort of thing. So I started talking to recruiters, actually with the Navy recruiter first, but uh, he didn't do a good job. So I ended up at the Army recruiter. Uh, of course, they talked about airborne and such. And uh, so I ended up um, signing up. Um, so you, you enlisted at this point? I enlisted, right? yeah. yes. And what, what year do you think? When was this, do you think? Um, I enlisted in November, early November, uh, entered, I, excuse me, I entered basic training early November of uh, 
of um, 1983. Okay. So uh, I actually signed up delayed entry uh, June of that year. Yeah. Okay. And where'd you go for your initial training? Um, Army Church, Fort Benning. Okay. So that was the, the basic training? <laughs> basic and AIT. So they had one station unit training then. So yeah. you did your basic and your um, advanced training. Um, so they call it infantry OSUT. And, did, and when you when you initially enlisted, what did you sign up for? Uh, I signed up for infantry and I uh, airborne. So I ended up uh, after my infantry training, I went straight to airborne school. Right at Fort at, Benning. Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. So just tell folks that maybe aren't familiar, uh, what was airborne school like for you? Um, airborne school, it was pretty pretty thrilling actually. You know, um, you go through in, in the training phase and all that, and then when you actually go and jump out of the aircraft. Your first one, it's like, you know, you rush to the door and you're out the door and you're like, oh, wow, and then you're on the ground. So no big deal. The second one gets a little more scary because then you know, okay, I'm really got to walk out of this airplane and all that. But it, it was pretty interesting. It was pretty thrilling. You know, it, it was something that I found, uh, you know, to be fun. And, um, you know, of course, it got a little more tedious in the 82nd after, you know, uh, 60 some odd jumps and all, carrying the parachute and the ruck and everything else. But yeah, so the initial training was just what, five? Five jumps? Yeah, you have to complete five jumps in airborne school to um, to complete. But then you had many, many more jumps. It oh, yeah. Like, uh, I was assigned to the first 504 uh, in the 82nd as an instrument, Charlie Company. Spent my whole time there. Um, but uh, most of my uh, my first days were on a 60 team. And then uh, so I ended up jumping with a 60 a lot and that sort of thing and, and all the ammo that you have to carry. Um, yeah, but, how much do you think you were carrying when you would jump? Ooh, I don't know. It, it felt a lot more than it probably was. But... Uh, you know, I had a boat boat back many a time, trying to waddle to the door to get out of that aircraft. Yeah. Well, and um, you ended up staying in the military for a long time. So, at, from your initial entry and your basic training, uh, how do you feel you adapted from high school student now to army soldier? Um, <clears throat> well, the first four years there in the infantry really matured me a lot and it took that to, for me to get there but um, you know I made a decision I want to go to school I want to get some more education because I knew that was important my dad was a college professor so there was some influence there but um, so I decided to uh, I left the active service went in the reserve and, and there in Clemson a um, training unit a drill sergeant unit and then uh, I went to Clemson got my commission and came back in getting my commission was you know, I didn't think I was going to happen, but uh, it, it was a natural progression. I was married at the time, and um, so, you know, between my wife and I, we decided that, you know, the military was a good career path. It was a good way to, you know, spend your time. So, got a commission and came back in. Well, so was the Clemson, was it an ROTC program? Or, ROTC, or, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you, you commissioned then. So now, you, what year do you think this was? Um, I graduated in 91. I was the cadet battalion commander for the, for the Clemson ROTC there. Um, my senior year, so that was a pretty good time too. It was interesting. Well, and and I would I would bet though having what four or five years of enlisted time in the infantry, you, you probably uh, were were an outstanding cadet on the ROTC side. Well, I, I did pretty good and all that, and just the fact that I I was a little more mature. I've been married. Um, I got married before I went in the army in '83, so I got okay. married in '83 also. So uh, I was a little more mature. I had two kids at the time going to Clemson, trying to go to school and all that. So I think the maturity helped me out. I knew I couldn't afford you know, just to waste the time. And um, so uh, that helped out. And um, yeah, um, you know, that, that helped me earn the spot as the, the battalion commander there um, through that time. Well, so now it's, it's 1991, you're, you're, you're commissioning um, second, second lieutenant, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where did you, did you do any additional training then? Did they, what, send you to infantry school or? Um, so yes, uh, well, I went to air assault school as a cadet actually, and okay. I, I got that completed. Um, already had my, uh, I got my, earned my senior wings. Um, um, prior to that, I went to jump master school while I was enlisted. Okay. So uh, after that, I decided I'd go off to the 101st, and that's my first selection. But uh, I went through the infantry uh, basic officer's course at Benning, and then went off to Fort Campbell for the 101st, first 327. Excellent, excellent. And then um, did you remain an infantry officer throughout your career, or did you do something else? Um, well, after I did about four years in, at Fort Campbell as an infantry officer, um, serving there, then uh, I kind of made a decision I wanted to try something a little bit different. Went back to Benning for my my infantry advance course, but after that I applied for and uh, went to selection, Special Forces Qualification Selection. I passed that and went on to the uh, officer you know, qualification course. Yeah, well, so just tell tell us, or for, or for the people that don't know, tell us what like uh, the selection process was and then the, the qualification course. Um, selection uh, takes uh, about two weeks, uh, 10 days, I think it is actually. 
um, at that time. Um, the first phase, first week is uh, individual. So basically it's a test of you know your capabilities, uh, mental and uh, physical. And they really put you through the ringer just to see what you're made of and that sort of thing. And uh, you lose probably, I don't know, um, I would probably say about half the class at that. By the end of that week, people um, either break or give up, that sort of thing. The second week is um, a team week. So they want to see how you work with a team because that's the concept behind Special Forces. You work with a team and you have to you know, pull your weight and get along with everybody else. But uh, so you work as a team and again you lose quite a few people um, of the, I, I think you know only about 20 percent of the people make it through selection you know the first time that sort of thing. But mm. uh, it was a great test, uh, test of my abilities. I'd already been to SEER school one time um, that was a great experience also, but... Uh, and just, if somebody doesn't know, what, what is, what uh, is Survival, that? evasion, resistance, and escape. It's a, uh, you know, um, it teaches you how to evade capture, and then when you do get captured, how to, to survive as a captured uh, person. So, um, or, or military member, but, uh, so those type of schools really, they, they teach you a lot. I always say that um, Ranger School is the toughest school I ever went to. Um, because of the length of it and to get through is very hard and all that. Um, I say SEER school is probably the best school I've ever been to teach you something, you know, about yourself and all that. And then um, Special Forces uh, um, qualification course, you learn so much. I'd say that's the best school I've ever been to teach me all different skills and, you know, things that I can end up doing and use later on. So some good schools there. Yeah, so then as you finished with the Special Forces qualification, you're now um, a Special Forces officer. You're still an officer. You're, what, a captain now? Or? Um, captain, yes. And, um, you know, I was assigned to 3rd Special Forces Group um, at, uh, at Fort Bragg. Um, and uh, most of my time there, uh, training time there, was spent uh, serving in Africa and, you know, and areas of the world. So I had some good times over there. Well, and I know your your major combat deployment, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, was with OIF. But you mentioned Africa and, and serving with the Special Forces Group. Any any kind of um, conflicts or what? Any operations in Africa that you did, or that you can talk about? Um, yeah, most of those training type assignments, training. whatever you know, you you go over. They're called FID. Um, uh, they're called uh, FID missions, Forward Internal Defense, where you you go over and you train with a or train not with, but you train a foreign military to. Um, Organized. So I uh, went to Equatorial Guinea um, and trained um, uh, uh, 150 some odd um, of their soldiers, infantry soldiers, in marksmanship and, and infantry type skills. Um, and he had some interesting times there. Uh, the president's son was in the course when, when he decided to show up. The president oh, of Equatorial uh, Guinea. Uh, of, of that, okay, yeah, yeah right. I'm sorry. I was thinking of the, no, no, that's fine. I was, I was thinking of the U.S. So. No, no. Yeah. Um, so okay. we had a good time there. And, and actually. Well, so, so was the president's son of Equ the president of Equatorial Guinea's son, was he a competent soldier? Or, or, uh, um, yeah, he was a smart individual, competent and all that, but uh, he was also the Minister of Agriculture and some other duties. So we saw him when he was able to show up. So that was the one thing that was a little bit uh, less. And also, he had advantages over the majority of the soldiers there who who didn't have a lot. So uh, one of the things we did to help with the course, once I went over there on a pre-site um, a site survey and all that, and, and we kind of realized that these guys can't see very good. So, you know, in the U.S., you don't think too much about glasses and eyewear, but uh, over there, they just didn't have them. That was a luxury. And so uh, I was able to bring over a, uh, a eye doctor from the States. She, uh, she actually um, um, examined all the soldiers and um, we sent back for, for prescriptions and had glasses made, brought them back over, so that they would be more effective in their marksmanship and all that. And wow. it turned out very good. Now, they didn't all bring them because now they had this luxury item that they didn't want to break or bring to training. It's oh, like, it was too valuable to. Uh, we had we had to encourage them to wear them during training, you know, because, so yeah. they could actually see better and do a better job. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and so maybe just for the for the interview too, maybe just tell uh, the audience who. Maybe their idea of special forces is a John Wayne movie and a bunch of Green Berets doing a combat operation. You obviously know a lot more about it. It's more about the training. Just maybe just expand on that a little bit. Uh, what the mission of the special forces? Um, obviously, for any to to be able to go to combat and do anything, you have to train for it, and you have to train over and over again on the same thing. You know, to get good at it. So a lot of it uh, for special forces is how you interact with foreign people. Um, so. 
going to Africa um, and other places in the world, you get the opportunity to interact with them. You learn, you know, how to deal with them and that. And there's a lot of, um, was it, cultural things that you have to be aware of and you have to learn. So, uh, you know, you, you spend a lot of time. I also um, had a mission in Swaziland. Swaziland still has a king. So that was pretty interesting too. And some of the culture and all and the way they do things, it's something you, you um, immerse yourself in. Um, so, you know, Special Forces does a lot of training of forward militaries, a lot of, um, what do you say, uh, you know, goodwill type missions also, um, just to, to, so they will interact with you as much as you want, you know, so you can get more out of them uh, or get to know them better. That sort of thing. Well, and and maybe too, just um, just tell us a little bit. I think one of the hallmarks of the special forces was it's a it's a small group. It's a, it's, are you guys on the team concept? So um, so as a captain, I ran a detachment and that detachment. Detach so it's an eleven man detachment, um, and so you have uh, you know two teams that you can break into within that, and so that's the operational type of environment. And you have uh, you have a, a warrant officer who's your second in charge, and you have a, a master sergeant who is your your senior NCO, and then you have you know a selection of senior NCOs under that. Um, um, the one thing about Special Forces in that small unit is um, they are senior and they're very experienced, and you got a high quality of individual. So those individuals, you don't have to like when I was in the infantry, I came in as an E1, a private E1. Um, I didn't know anything, and of course, as a young person, I also had a lot of uh, distractions, I guess you could say, you know. As a senior person, when you're working with senior people, you know, you're expected to do your job and you do do your job and you take pride in that. So on a team, you get a much more experienced group of individuals and you can rely on them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, other than the Iraq, anything else significant stand out from your special forces time not in Iraq? Um, something um, kind of funny or dangerous or scary or... Oh. There's probably thousands. Let's see. Of well, in Equatorial Guinea, we, um, the, you know, I told you the president's son was in our course. Well, he invited us to come to one of his palaces. Oh, wow. He had several, apparently. Um, and this was on the ocean, all that. So he, we, we, we took that invitation, didn't want to insult. Uh, <laughs> we went and all that. And he brought out all his speedboats and jet skis, and we got to play on the ocean. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it um, was uh, my team sergeant and my warrant um, officer, they were both old scuba guys. So they enjoyed swimming in the ocean, no big deal. Well, they took me out. They said, we're going to do a training mission. They took me out in a boat. Uh, we dropped off, the whole team dropped off about a mile out, dropped in the ocean, we finned back. Well, the one thing they didn't tell me about was all the uh, jellyfish that you had to swim through. And by the time I got back, my legs and calves were just smoked because I wasn't a scuba guy at all. But uh, yeah, they enjoyed the heck out of that. But it was fun. But uh, you, you drop yourself out in the middle of the ocean, you know, off uh, the African coast, and it, it's a little, it could be a little hairy. So that was one of the good times. Could you still see shore? Or, um... Um, you, well, you can see some of the features, but uh, there weren't a lot of buildings other than, you know, you know, some but of it was the... Pretty, I mean, a mile and a half is pretty far. Yeah, it's and, pretty and far out Psychologically, there. if you can't really see where you're going, you're... yeah. Another one that um, is, I found interesting, and I'll try to be careful how I say this, in Swaziland, the king each year chooses a new wife. So in order for the, the lady, so he can view these ladies, traditionally they come and they dance for him. And so they have this big party where all the ladies that, you know, want to be eligible, including those that know they aren't, you know, if they're not married, they can come dance. And, and for whatever reason, they do this topless. So they come and they do all this dance. So that was something we weren't expecting. It was uh, it, some of these cultural things you really get to enjoy. But you had to do your duty and, and <laughs> well, we, keep we, an eye on the situation. We enjoyed the festivities and all that, you know, their part. And um, it, was, it was pretty interesting. Well, so then let's... Um, Jump forward or move around a little bit. So you ended up serving in in Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, OIF. What uh, rotation was this, and what what kind of set the table for what the time frame was? Okay, so what um, you were in that kind of stuff. So I came up to Virginia um, from um, Fort Bragg in North Carolina in 2000 for a special ops job, and I spent some time in that job, but. Um, uh, I kind of made a pact with my family that the next assignment or next job would try to be for family. So mm -hmm. at that point in time, um, I transitioned into um, my career field, which was operation, operations research systems analyst. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, that's much different than what I had been doing. So I left the operational side of the house and I went into, you know, more of a analytical staff type jobs. Um, I went to school at uh, George Mason, got my master's. 
finished up with that and I went uh, to work for Center for Army Analysis. Well, I deployed from there to Iraq um, as an analyst, actually working on the uh, Petraeus and Odierno staff. Um, uh, working for actually uh, Colonel Murray, who is now General Murray, um, uh, I believe he's a futures commander right now. Um, so that was an interesting time. We're at Camp Victory, and um, I'm sorry. What what year do you think this was? Uh, this was in 2007. Okay, so it wasn't the initial OIF, but it was. No, I was actually in school in 2005 when the invasion kicked off. I yeah. was actually in school at that time. So this was still kind of to the early side, early to the middle of our deployments to mm -hmm. Iraq. It sounds like. Okay, yeah. Sorry. So Camp Victory. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Spent my most of my time at Camp at Camp Victory. Um, and then deploying out from there, doing different jobs, and you know, as part of the staff there. So not too exciting, but yeah, so what does an ORSA, uh, the, the ORSA analyst, do in Iraq? Um, so we tracked um, and reported um, a lot of the the incidents that would happen over there. And I say incidents. Um, anytime um, there was a conflict, um, there was you know data and all this. Um, the generals there, the leadership, um, took a lot of interest in how to track that and see what was happening. Where were the incidents happening? You know, Al Anbar or other, you know, other places, that sort of thing. And, and we would track all that to figure out where the biggest conflict was happening, um, where we were getting hit to try to track what um, the enemy was doing at the time. And so you, how long were you there? How long? Um, I spent about seven months there. Um, okay. um, we spent, it was a rotation um, out of my uh, unit here and, uh, um, so not, not a long time, but, uh, well, certainly long enough. And, the, and that was the prescribed tour. But so when you're doing this data analysis, I mean, you're, you're not necessarily doing it by yourself. I would imagine you're working with the Intel guys and kind of, how do you, how, do, how does that get all pulled together? How do you guys pull that together? Um, well, we had geospatial, um, folks we leaned on, um, uh, the Intel analysts. Um, I worked in the operations, um, unit of the headquarters of the, of the, um, the U S, um, the U.S. base, you know, headquarters there, um, but uh, we had access to all this different information. Uh, we tracked a lot of computer systems and reporting systems within the country um, that came into us, and we did some outside jobs for the, uh, you know, for um, for the JASODA, the Joint uh, Special Operations Task Force, and some of the other task force there when they asked for it. And what was your rank at the at the time? Now, um, I was a um, major at that time. And were you a, a team le a leader of a section or something, or were you more just a guy doing his job? Um, the way it was, um, I reported to the, uh, the the colonel that was in charge of the operations section. Um, the uh, actual S three was Colonel Murray at the time. Yeah. Um, or not S three G three. But uh, so we just worked in in as part of that cell. But we reported straight to the the the, the operations. Chief, okay. I guess is his okay. title. Well, just um, maybe describe a little bit what your your living conditions were at Camp Victory for those seven months. Oh, uh, yeah, not too bad. I mean, we had uh, small trailers that you stayed in, that sort of thing. You had, well, actually, had your own personal trailer. Um, you know, <laughs> Camp Victory was obviously walled off all around and all that. But every day, you had to walk back and forth. You know, from your your uh, your, your your house, your your little bunk room there, and um, your office, but. Uh, you know, the, uh, they had these um, um, automated, um, I, I guess you call them Gatling, uh, not Gatling guns, but like Gatling guns, a Michigan gun, Vulcans, whatever, for shooting at um, anti-aircraft stuff. Well, you'd walk by and that thing would just kick off without any warning and that oh, wow. thing was loud. So yeah. it, you, had, you had some interesting times. And we'd get, uh, you know, they would shell the post randomly and that sort of thing. Um, one incident, uh, you know, we were in, I was actually in the office in the in one of the buildings there, but, uh, you know, they shelled, you know, they had their emergency drills and sirens and all that. We came out later and found out, you know, all our bikes got shredded because, you know, a, a mortar or what have you landed directly on top of the bike rack. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you had a battle drill, though, if, if oh, yeah, a exactly. siren went off yeah. or you heard something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then what about your experiences outside the base? I mean, it sounded like you said earlier, you, you did go out a few times. Yeah, we, we would go to some of the other um, sites or camps, what have you, to uh, do analysis and all that. Um, uh, we had always joined up with a, you know, a convoy that was going out. They had a lot of, you know, they had resupply convoys going and coming all the time. Um, so we would just join up with one of those and get a hitch a ride, basically. Okay. And, uh, and we'd go out and we'd stay for a few days, whatever it took to get the job done um, at some of these outposts. And I guess during your your convoy operations, some of the maybe just describe what some of the threats and risks were when you're out on a convoy. 
Well, I think, you know, the, the biggest nervousness was when we get, you know, into traffic. Now, obviously, um, you know, uh, about that time, I think their, uh, their, their Iraqis themselves were getting pretty used to having us around, so they would, they would most of the time just get out of the way, pull over and all that. If they didn't, that's when the, uh, you know, the U.S. soldiers that were guarding us, you know, the convoy security would get uh, pretty nervous about it. But um, for the most part, we, I, I never experienced a problem while we were transition around there. Okay, so no IEDs or what vehicle-borne no. IEDs or a car would try to ram into They did a no, they did a they did a good job of securing, they did a good job of clearing these routes on a regular basis. I mean, they're clearing them daily. Okay. So. Well, and, and uh, maybe just what kind of hours were you working? Um, <laughs> people have a vision of soldiers in the combat zone are working 24/7. Maybe just what was your uh, personal experience? Yeah, I think um, we averaged about 14-hour days. So you, you worked, um, you you went to the chow hall, you got your food when you needed to, and then you went and got in bed basically, and you slept and you did it again. So you know you didn't have a lot of you didn't have a lot of free time. Um, you you did your work and all that because there's no reason to have free time really, uh, other than to rest and recuperate because you did have to do that. Otherwise, you couldn't think straight. Yeah. Um, well, and you were married at the at the time, and, mm -hmm. and have the family. Um, how did you stay in contact with loved ones back in the in the states? Oh, um, occasionally you could go, um, and they had a phone system set up to where you could make phone calls back. You had to coordinate that because the time was, you know, time zones are very different and all that. But uh, occasionally I'd get the chance to call back and just uh, you know have a short chat with my wife. Okay, and and uh, mail was still flowing back and forth for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, I would get mail, no problem. Um, you know, when they'd send it in and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't have a uh, you know, no phone. Uh, can't you know, communication like that. Um, you could do email, I guess. You know, um, the, the the computer systems obviously were separate, but um, I could get some email and that sort of thing. Using they had uh, um, computer huts. Set up. Okay. Yeah. So you know they were very busy, obviously. So you had to go in and you know wait in line and wait till you get a chance, but you could get on the computer. Okay. Um, and you mentioned you you were very busy and, and a little bit of downtime just to rest and recuperate. Were mm -hmm. there any like MW uh, morale, welfare, and recreation, or mm -hmm. or gym facilities? Oh there yeah. A little bit of free time that you had. What were you able to do? Well, I did go to the gym regularly every day, basically keep up that. And we ran. Um, you know, within the compound, I, I, I did do my PT every day, my physical training, um, and we'd, I played a little bit of soccer. I mean, soccer. They, you know, they had some court soccer, you know, and we'd play a little bit of soccer, that sort of thing. And so, like, playing soccer or any of this the, at your base, was it just a U.S. personnel base, or were you working with other countries? Oh, yeah. The, there was a lot of contractors. So, Camp Victory, although it was the main base, there's about uh, 10 different camps that made up the Victory base. So Camp Victory was the primary hub because that was the headquarters. Um, but uh, yeah, you had contractors from every part of the world there um, doing whatever, food service and, and everything else, um, vehicle maintenance and all this because uh, there was just so much going on that we didn't have enough, there was enough soldiers or, um, or military to, to do that. So you had a lot of um, nationalities on that. On that of, the con of the contract. Force. Yes, yes, um, but not necessarily for a foreign military. Oh, we had uh, the we worked with Australians, we worked with the Brits, we worked with um, I'm gonna say who else? Um, there were other militaries there, and, and usually in smaller capacity, but uh, okay. we did do some work with them. Okay, and and, and I think you kind of address this when you went when you deployed over, you were more or less an individual sent over, or were you, were you right. part of it? Okay, so yeah. so. How did that work? Did you on your deployment? Did you have to do any special um, Kona space training before you deployed over, or you just hopped on a plane and you ended up in Iraq? Um, well, yeah, you have to you have to qualify medically and all that um, before you ever leave, and they give you an assignment of uh, equipment that sort of thing. You transition through um, a um, you know in processing place like in Kuwait, and you come through there and you you get your your in theater gear, I guess you want to have it, um, and then they transition you into uh, you know into Iraq. At that time, yeah, and, and and mechanically, logistically, how did you get from Kuwait to Camp Victory? Um, I'm pretty sure that I flew on a helicopter. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah, and now it's seven months later. You're getting ready to come back to the states, Virginia, mm -hmm. probably specifically. How did you? Maybe just tell us how you got back home. What that process was Ooh, like. Um, oh, let's see. Because the, the Victory base was uh, around the uh, Baghdad airport. And so we, you know, the military had their portion of that that they used um, uh, coming in and out. So we flew out of the Victory Base basically when we had to transition back and forth to uh, 
um, within theater and then over to Kuwait. And so now to think about it, maybe we did fly a plane, um, um, probably something simple like a C-130 um, back over to Kuwait, and then we'd hop on an international flight out of there and, um, you know, to get back to the States. But I don't know, it's a, I don't remember too much of that. I think it was just, hey, I'm finally getting to go. Yeah, and then and so then now you're, there's no parade, welcome home ceremony, anything like that. You you met up with your wife, right? Like, what was that? Just yeah, tell my us wife, like that my experience. kids. They, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they met me at the uh, the airport. You know, when I got yeah. back, and uh, that was about it. Um, you know, um, yeah, it was pretty. I'm pretty tame and all that, which is good. I, that's what I prefer. But you get a couple of days off, or were you back to your? Oh other yeah, job? yeah. We, yeah. you know, I take a few days off to recuperate and all that, then uh, get back into the, uh, you know, back into the workplace. Okay. But, um, it was a regular rotating thing, so we had people that were coming and going. Every three months would have, um, you know, you'd kind of rotate people out every three, three and a half months. Um, so you'd have two of us over there from my actual um, Center for Armor Analysis here. Yeah, so you went back to that same office. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Basically seven, eight months later, now you're back right where you started from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I guess back to your Iraq time or even you know, on the Africa deployments, uh, operate training stuff. Did you have any friends or comrades that were um, wounded or killed on any of these operations? Um, or? Well, um, you know, my, my eldest son um, decided to join the Army. He, he did a year out of high school at, at George Mason University uh, and joined the ROTC program. And he was in junior ROTC in high school, too. So um, he had grown up through Fort Bragg. And, and, and my, what's, I'm sorry, what's your son's name? Oh, I'm sorry, Dylan. Dylan yeah, Dylan's your son, so, Dylan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, he had grown up with me at uh, Benning, Bragg, and, you know, my Campbell, my military days. And so, especially with uh, me and the infantry and the special forces, so I guess he got the bug and all that. He did a year of the RTC at George Mason, um, did really well and all that, but um, that was in 2004. And so he, you know, that was when the Iraqi, uh, you know, the invasion kicked off in 2003. So he was getting that bug and started feeling like he should serve. I tried to convince him to stay in school, but he decided he wanted to enlist. So he started talking to recruit and all. He did enlist. He, he enlisted for the infantry and, um, he ended up, uh, let's see, in 2005, he, he uh, went to basic training, AIT, Airborne School, um, and then he caught up to his unit at that time, which was the 3rd Ranger Battalion. And so um, they sent him over to catch up with his assigned um, you know, platoon over in Iraq at the time. Um, so he got over there uh, later in the year, um, I want to say uh, September, August or September in that time frame. And um, his, uh, he, um, he ended up, uh, they were doing a mission on the, the Syrian border, um, and uh, he ended up taking, uh, getting hit there. Yeah. And so he ended up passing uh, before he got back. So we, we lost our eldest son. Yeah, I'm sorry for your loss. I saw your, your, your car and the dedication to, uh, uh, that's, I mean, that's tough. I'm sorry for your loss. But that, uh, again, I mean, quite an accomplishment for a young soldier to, to get into the Rangers, you had mentioned before how tough the Ranger training was. So, uh, yeah, he he went through an accomplishment there. Yeah, he was um, physically fit, very you know very athletic. Uh, coming up through school, he played soccer the entire time and all that, and uh, so he, he was really uh, motivated. And he did a very good job. Uh, did well. He ended up with the uh, uh, Bronze Star with Valor yeah. um, for a V device, um, yeah. and uh, for his effort over there. Yeah, and it sounds like he was doing what he wanted to do with with the, the fellow soldiers that he wanted to be with. Um, well, so then, you know, your your career did not end after your time in Iraq. What else did you do um, later uh, in the military? Um, well, you know, as a as a ops analyst, um, it was a good career field. Um, but I ended up doing some. I worked uh, CA Center for Armor Analysis actually under Army staff, so I kind of worked uh, did a lot of Army staff work, and then I worked on the Joint Staff. Um, I actually did a stint over at the George Mason ROTC um, and. Uh, I was an instructor there for a okay. short time. How was, how was that? How do you like that? Uh, that? Yeah, it was pretty interesting and pretty fun. It was much different, you know, being an instructor. I actually taught the uh, the first year students, okay. and so you got a chance to influence yeah. them. I was also like the recruiting officer. Um, so I was, my, uh, battalion, my battalion commander, the ROTC battalion commander, she gave me the opportunity to, um, you know, to try new things. So we started stuff like uh, repelling off the library at George Mason. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and that's a pretty tall library there. Yeah. So it took me a while to get everybody to sign off on that, but that was a heck of a recruiting tool. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. so we had a real good time with some of that. Um, I did enjoy my time as an instructor. And I see, I'm looking at your, your sheet here. You did a, a deployment or um, something in the Sinai in Egypt? Oh, um, yeah. Well, I was part of the 101st um, at Fort Campbell. Um, we did the Sinai um, uh, National uh, 
Oh yeah, the yeah, peacekeeping. The, yeah. Uh, what's it? Um, yeah, like the six month thing there or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, we did that. So um, that was that was a good time too. I uh, the uh, I was assigned as a liaison officer. So I was assigned on the Egyptian Israeli border. So I got to interact with both the Egyptians and the Israelis on a daily basis. And I spent um, you know I spent a lot of time sitting down with them, both of them. And I had um, you know opportunity to go into Israel and, and work with them. It's a little bit different. Uh, you go there and you, you know. Everybody's walking around with a gun slung on their back, so it's a little bit different environment than yeah. you see here. Um, but uh, everybody got along pretty good. Um, well, this would have been earlier in your career, right? As a, yeah, I was. A uh, that would have been in uh, 90, um, 94, pre, somewhere pre, in that time. Pre frame. special forces, probably. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so do you speak Arabic or Hebrew, or <laughs> um, how were you able to communicate with the other forces? There? Well, in special forces, you're trained in the language. I was trained in French, but the problem was. Um, I went to Equatorial Guinea as one of my first assignments, which was a former, you know, uh, Spanish colony. Mm. I went to Swaziland, which is a former English colony. I never really immersed in the language, so I didn't get to use my French that much, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, a little bit of time in Cameroon, um, where they speak, speak some French and all that. And then later on, um, uh, we, you know, taught ourselves some Arabic and that sort of thing for the deployment in the Middle East, but uh, and and some of my time in Egypt. But um, yeah, really, yeah, I don't have a good uh, you know, uh, second language capability. Never had opportunity to really develop it. Yeah, did you get a, when you were in the Sinai and you were working with, it's interesting you were working with the Egyptian and the Israeli, mm -hmm. um, maybe not always at the same time, but what, did you feel like tension and animosity between the military soldiers mm. or was it mutual respect or something in between? Um, for the most part, um, I never worked with them, in, in, you know, at the same time, it was either one or the other. And um, yeah, they're they're professional. Um, you know, I, I never saw any, uh, problems um, between where they would talk bad about one another that sort of thing other than some cultural issues and that sort of yeah uh, but um it was uh it was it was i mean that's one of those lifetime opportunities you you may you know if you get you know, it's really good uh, and i think uh you know being fellow soldiers and maybe with these egyptian and israelis knowing what war can be like you kind of want to avoid it maybe those guys were I think you know, so. On that border, I think would so. try to do whatever they could. Yeah. They have this competition over there um, as part of the Sinai Peacekeeping Mission. Um, it's uh, a uh, competition where the officers, you know, you get a team together and you compete. Well, you know, you, you've got Colombian, uh, the Colombian Army there. You got the Fijian Army and other armies there. But uh, they were the biggest ones. So uh, the U.S. We had our team, and I was part of that team. Oh wow! And it's um, you know, it's a uh, it's the standard stuff: ruck march, um, you know, and run. Um, uh, marksmanship qualification and some other you know basic skills like that and you had to go through and each each member of your team had to compete and get um uh you know you, you got a score or whatever yeah, and yeah. we did <laughs> we did pretty good um <coughs> you, know, you go against uh, like the fijians were this you know big old people uh big guys you know for the most part and then the fijians and all that and some really quality uh you know officers and 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 um soldiers and all that we'd run into so that was kind of interesting yeah well, so, some of my time in Special Forces, you know, the, the I've gotten to do some additional training, and um, the some officers from other, you know, we share opportunities. But um, I've trained with a lot of officers um, from other countries, and there's been some outstanding, outstanding officers that come in and train. So it, it's good to interact, and you, you yeah, see, absolutely. you see a lot of, um, you know. Uh, armies that take it seriously but for the most part yeah the, the, they don't want to have conflict you know and there's a reason you train you know and you, you try to discourage that type of thing as much as possible yeah absolutely absolutely well so you ended up retiring in um, 2017 yeah mm -hmm. and how many years of service was that for you well I spent uh, what about 33 just uh, the plus side of 33 years in uh, a military but I've got a 30-year retirement active duty retirement with the army um, and uh, you know that was that was a great career. I mean, I had a uh, everything. I had a good time, and I learned a lot and a lot of opportunities while I was there. Yeah, and so I'm just looking again at the bio. So uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what was your retirement ceremony like? What you what you do? Well, I did. They have a um, a ceremony at Fort Myer, and so they you know where you that all ranks in the military who are retiring can go up there. So I chose to do that um, as opposed to have an individual ceremony. Um, they bring out the old guard, they play, um, you know, and um, they have, it, it's very impressive when you bring in, you know, people to come watch, 
you know, they see that and they're really impressed with it. So I encourage others to, uh, you know, if they have the opportunity to go view it, you can go view it. Uh, but and you had your fa your family and friends come yeah. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what you you don't happen to remember which month it was, do you? Because because I, I did my ceremony up there too. Oh, okay. I think it was um, August of 2017. Yeah, I retired in September of 2017. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, it was we might uh, have been in the, the same ceremony, ceremony would have been right right about there, maybe yeah. in August. Yeah, I did mine a couple months before. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. That's that's small world, right? Yeah. Um, Okay, and then w w you kind of mentioned briefly we were talking before the interview. You're you're still serving now uh, as a civilian. Mm -hmm. um, just maybe tell us what you're doing now. So uh, um, I work now for a, a company um, up in uh, Alexandria. Um, I do. It's a defense contractor. We do analytical type of work. Um, we support um, Office of Secretary of Defense. We support uh, and they're they're you know sub offices like DARPA, um, the Strategic Capabilities Office, et cetera. Um, we support, we have contracts with the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, um, all services, and we do a lot of different interesting work. A lot of it is technical analysis. Um, uh, a lot of the work I do right now is looking at uh, autonomy and autonomous systems and that sort of thing. Um, a big future there, something to invest in if you want. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, I've been doing that for um, three and a half years now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Yeah, you're still still serving. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like to ask this question too. I'm looking at your um, couple of your awards. You know, you, you earned the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. um, is there one of the awards that that you earned personally that really stands out that you'd like to talk about? Or you know, looking at it the other way as a leader, is there an award that you were ever able to give to one of your soldiers that was really meaningful for you? Either one that you received or one that you were able to mm. put somebody in for and get for one of your soldiers. For me, the awards, um, it's nice to be recognized, um, but they mattered a little bit less than some of the training opportunities that I had. Like I said, Special Forces and putting that tab on, Ranger tab, it kind of showed that you, you know, you've got a skill set or you performed a skill set. Um, and having the opportunity to, to encourage and get your soldiers to go through some of that training and expand, it's education. I, to me, education opens up so many opportunities for you. You know, when I was growing up young and all, although my dad was a college professor, um, I had a lot of friends that didn't have that type of opportunity. Um, they didn't didn't have the encouragement or, or the experience to know that they could go do that sort of thing. And uh, But the education is a key, I think, to open up opportunities. And, and the same thing goes in the military. Um, the fact that, you know, I was able to do airborne, air assault in some of these schools, I learned so much and it opened up opportunities for me so yeah anytime you can go and branch out and learn something new i'd say do it that's a good good way to look at it mm -hmm. um what well, so looking at the whole body of work how, how do you think your your military service in general and then specifically your your, your combat time whether uh in iraq and, and we'll kind of count the training time in africa how do you think those operational type things have affected your your view of the world and you personally um you see all different sides, just like you do here in the U.S., uh, of people. I mean, you, every country has their good and their bad. Um, uh, every country has their issues um, and the things that, you know, upsets people and gets them going and all that. Um, I've ran into people that would, you know, trust me and, and befriend with me without a, a second thought. And I ran into people that were a little, you know, you know, um, a little, uh, you know, uh, wary of Americans simply because you're American um, and the things they've heard. The news and that sort of thing really uh, has influence on everybody in the world. So it's they, I think the news should be very careful about what they put out there. And we sh you, know, you should only take what you hear. You should make sure you know what you hear, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, be very careful. But, uh, I mean... Meeting up with people and working with people, actually just, you know, not just walking through an airport or something like that, but actually working with people. You learn so much about the characteristics and the type of people, and, and you really get to know them. You, you get a lot of friends that way. You know, maybe not people that you'll keep in touch with, but you, you feel like they're friends, and they, they do respect what you do, and you respect what they do. So it's just, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity there to go out and view the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so looking ahead, you know, 50 or a uh, hundred years from now, we're probably both gone from this great planet, but um, what would you want future generations or just the American people to know about you, uh, you know, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, or just the American public 50, 100 years from now know about you and your military service? 
Hmm. Um, know about me. Um, the military for me, I was a little hesitant up front, but uh, it turned out to be um, a great experience and a great career. Um, it actually, family is one of the most important things to me, but I think it actually gave me the opportunity to uh, to maintain and, and have a strong family because you know over the years you can, you, you have, well, you have your, your personal family, but you also have your military family and uh, you meet a lot of different people. The military has you moving around from different places. And so you meet a lot of different pieces of people and you learn a lot from that and you, you accept, I think, a lot more than if you just don't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, if you stay in your you know, hometown and you never branch out from there, well, you're, you're gonna be a little biased about everything else for the most part because you just don't have that experience. Yeah. But um, I think uh, if you have the opportunity, you know, travel, see a little bit of the world, um, you don't need to see it all. Um, <laughs> Uh, don't be afraid to serve in some capacity in one of the military services or, or as, you know, in, in, in something that matters, you know, law enforcement, teaching, nursing, any of that uh, medical field. Um, if you have an opportunity to do it, um, just get out there, branch out, push Absolutely. yourself. Yep, no, I, I agree, that's, that's well said. Um, well, we covered a lot of ground. You had a, a, a long and distinguished career. You did a lot of different things on tactical to operational and everything in between. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss or cover or, or, or revisit uh, that we've already talked about? No, um, I've had uh, you know one one connotation about the military and, and that type of life is marriage. I've had uh, 37 and a half year marriage right now, so it's worked out for me very well. Um, Congratulations! I think uh, you know spending that time we we left our hometown of Anderson, South Carolina, many years ago, and I think that strengthened you know having a having to spend our time together. So I can say, uh, you know, for me, it's, you know, I've gotten a lot from the experience. And, and now as a retired uh, military person, you know, looking toward my final retirement, um, I'm, I'm well situated and I think uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, enjoying my future years. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Well, I, on camera still, just say thank you. It's been thank a pleasure. You. I really enjoy doing this. And, yeah, I appreciate uh, you having me.